Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to the front row. My name is Jamie Williamson. I'm the Executive Vice President here at Scripps Research. So it's a pleasure today to welcome you all to our webinar uh, featuring Professor Silke Paust. Uh, before uh, I introduce Silke, I would like to say a few things about what's going on here uh, at Scripps. The topic of today's lecture is immunology and uh, uh, immunotherapy approaches to cancer. But Scripps uh, was actually founded uh, on the, uh, the subject of immunology and Frank Dixon was the first president of Scripps Research and he re uh, recruited a number of exceptional colleagues here, including some of you may know Charlie Cochran, who uh, is the inventor of Surfaxin. Uh, and Frank led the, the Scripps research until 1987. And then he was succeeded by Richard Lerner. And Richard was also an immunologist. He created uh, antibody libraries and he developed the humanized antibody technologies that led to uh, the creation of, of medicines you might have heard of, including Humira and Ben Lista. And actually, Richard uh, was the one that hired me to come to Scripps about 25 years ago. Uh, so the current chair of immunology is Professor Dennis Burton. And uh, he has a, a tremendous program on looking at uh, neutralizing antibodies, in particular against HIV and COVID. And he's been ranked as one of the 10 best immunologists in the world. So we have a really stellar uh, group of people here at Scripps Research developing uh, vaccines. Universal flu vaccine is in the works. We recently got a $67 million grant for pandemic preparedness, trying to make antivirals available uh, in case we have another episode such as we recently endured. And more to the point for today, uh, we're gonna hear about uh, cancer immunotherapies. So uh, before I uh, talk, before I introduce Silka, I, I think uh, one, one of the reasons cancer is so tough is cancer cells basically play a game of hide and seek against our immune system. Uh, the immune system is always trying to track down uh, foreign invaders, but the cancer cells are trying to, you know, mask themselves from being detected by the immune system. So immunotherapy is harnessing the power of the immune system to actually target and kill cancer cells. There's a lot of gains in this area, tremendous effort. There's all kinds of promising therapies, but some cancers are extremely difficult uh, in, to treat, and in particular, are, some are resistant to immunotherapy. And, and so uh, Silka is going to tell us today about natural killer cells that can be uh, trained to seek out and, and, and uh, attack the cancer cell. So by, uh, by developing these immunotherapies really requires basic research. There's a lot of stuff that goes on behind uh, creating a new medicine. And so what we're going to hear from Silka today is some of this amazing basic research uh, targeting a very, very difficult cancer. So uh, I, with no further ado, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce our up and coming star in immunology, Silka Paust. Welcome. Thank you, Jamie, for the kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I'm very excited to meet all of you by Zoom and to have the opportunity to share um, some of the more recent work that my laboratory has focused on over the last couple of years. Um, today, we're going to um, talk about tackling a very difficult to treat a highly metastatic tumor, pancreatic cancer, and what we have learned um, over the last few years about this tumor, its immune cells, and how we might be able to supercharge uh, a specific type of immune cell to uh, treat this very terrible, terrible disease. Um, I was asked to introduce myself in my lab with just one slide in the beginning of the talk, and um, science is really teamwork, and my lab um, is where the discoveries are made, and so most of the slide is dedicated to the people who work very hard every day to advance uh, basic research knowledge. Um, I became interested in uh, immunology in the 10th grade in high school after we had one lecture a uh, very basic one um, on immune cells and the fact that there is such a thing as an immune system that fights disease. Um, and I really um, walked away from that lecture feeling like I didn't quite get the full story. 
Um, and so I um, decided to study abroad in the United States um, to learn more about immune cells and how they work. Uh, first in Wisconsin, um, studying biochemistry. Um, both of my parents are, uh, parents are chemists, and so that's the most bio that um, was allowed. Um, and later on at Harvard, where I got my PhD in immunology. Um, as Jamie mentioned, I had the privilege to be supported by three fellowships in immunology, and they allowed me to really dive into this a natural killer immune cell. Um, and basically, um, if I had to summarize my postdoctoral findings in one sentence, it is that these cell types um, are actually long lived, which was not previously thought, and they can remember prior antigen exposure. And this is really important. If you want to make a therapy or a vaccine, the cell needs to stick around, it needs to be long lived, and it needs to actually remember what you immunized it with. And so um, these findings changed the field of natural killer cell biology and um, really formed the basis of my laboratory's interests. And so both as an assistant professor and then after my move to Scripps Research, um, we worked on understanding how natural killer immune cells can actually be used clinically to prevent or treat human disease. And I have to say many thanks to my lab for their hard work on this topic. And so today I'm going to give you an overview on the human pancreas and some facts on pancreatic cancer. Um, why are we actually interested in studying this? Uh, why does it need more uh, research? Um, I'll briefly introduce two cell types that actually protect us from cancer, the T cell and the natural killer cell. Um, we'll discuss failures of immunotherapy to cure pancreatic cancer and what we can learn from that. Um, also, what can we learn looking at the tumor about its immune cells and about the landscape, uh, the immunological landscape of pancreatic cancer? Um, I will show you some strategies of supercharging natural killer immune cells to cure pancreatic cancer and then give you a summary and a brief outlook. And I have to thank my colleague, Emily Mays here. Um, she did this super high resolution microscopy picture of a natural killer cell. And you can see the skeleton, basically the actin cytoskeleton in green. This is a cell that is activated and is sitting on a slide. And she, the cell thinks the slide is a diseased target that it needs to kill. And so it is polarizing these granules here in red to dump onto that target. And these um, granules are basically little bags full of um, proteins and enzymes that can punch a hole into a target cell and infuse enzymes into the target cell that then kill the target cell. And K cells are very efficient in doing that. Um, they can kill multiple cells at once repeatedly, and they can do this very quickly within minutes. And so seeing this, I always figured if the target cell could see, this is the last thing you will see, the NK cell sitting down on you and dumping those granules and killing what is virally infected or malignant. And this process goes on in us every day. This is why we keep healthy and during infection and malignancy, it is hopefully augmented and uh, keeps us from developing severe disease. So the pancreas is this sausage shaped organ behind your stomach um, and it helps your digestion and it regulates your blood sugar. There's an exocrine and an endocrine portion and this basically just means the pancreas secretes things into the blood screen or the stomach. And uh, basically the exocrine portion secretes digestive enzymes. This helps you digest fat and protein in your diet and the endocrine portion secretes hormones which then regulate your blood sugar. There are about 60,000 pancreatic cancer diagnoses annually in the United States and about 50,000 deaths from pancreatic cancer. Um, pancreatic cancer has the highest mortality rate of all cancers. This is why we want to study it. It is the third leading cause of cancer-related death after lung and colon cancer. Even though there are only 60,000 diagnoses annually, it is still the third leading cause of death. And the overall five-year survival rate is very low. It is about nine or 10%. Most of pancreatic cancer diagnoses are pancreatic duct adenocarcinoma, and this is the type of tumor we're studying. And it's basically the duct here and not the cells that secrete things. Um, and why that is, we don't quite know, but the majority of pancreatic cancer diagnoses are PDAC, basically. And so here is a graph that shows you the progress made in the five-year survival rate 
So how many people are still alive five years after their initial diagnosis for various cancers? And it starts in the 1970s and it ends at 2015. And you can see here that pancreatic cancer is really on the bottom and we went from 2% to about 8% on this graph, while many other cancers, including skin, breast, prostate, uh, leukemias, um, really improved in their five-year survival rate, and some of them are quite high. Pancreatic cancer has not improved, and this is true worldwide, not just in England. The graph here is from England, but if you look at other countries, the US, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, everybody's hovering mostly in the single digits. and so. We fairly failed to improve um, long-term survival for pancreatic cancer patients. The reason for this is that pancreatic cancer is often diagnosed as a late-stage disease. Um, I am not a doctor, um, but from the publications, I gather that basically people have some indigestion, some symptoms, but they're diffuse and they're not necessarily um, making one think, oh, there's something really wrong with me, I need to go to the doctor. And so over 50%, over half of pancreatic cancer diagnoses are um, made at an advanced stage when the cancer has already metastasized to the stomach, liver, and lung, and other sites. And stomach, liver, and lung cancer is also not easy to treat. And so you have already metastatic disease at diagnosis, and that gives you a very low uh, five-year survival rate. Um, and options are quite limited. Um, the FDA approved options are um, surgery if it is an early stage diagnosis um, and chemotherapy and radiation. And there aren't any FDA approved um, uh, immunotherapies generally, uh, except for a very low percentage of pancreatic cancers that have specific mutations that make the cancer more interesting to the immune system. And so, Options are limited, and we haven't really added new options uh, for a long time um, to improve um, treatment and to increase survival rates. And so this brings me to what in the immune system normally does kill your tumor. Um, we're going to talk about two types of cells. Um, Immunologists are not the most original when it comes to naming things. This is a T cell, and the other cell, as you already know, is the natural killer. Maybe has a better name. Um, cytotoxic T cells also kill infected and malignant cells, and this T cell here in green expresses a receptor that sees one specific piece of tumor or one specific piece of pathogen, and that is the only thing it can recognize. It will not see anything else. So if this T cell is specific to pancreatic cancer, it will not recognize flu, it will not recognize COVID or any other disease. And this little red dot here is basically the piece of tumor or the piece of pathogen that is presented to it by this helpful accessory cell um, to activate the T cell, which then goes on to multiply, to activate, and to see, search out this antigen, this piece on other cells, infected cells, tumor cells, to identify them and kill them. This process takes time. And this is why, you know, when you're sick, you don't immediately get better. Oftentimes it takes a few days, you know, if you have a cold and, you know, until you feel better, your T cells are activated, your T cells are proliferating, your T cells are starting to help, you know, eradicate the infection and then you feel better. This takes several days. And so, um, we have two things about T cells. They take several days to get activated, and then uh, they are also very, very specific for one single piece of pathogen or tumor. The good news is we have many different T cells, and so we can see many different pathogens and many different pieces of tumor because we have so many of them, but one really only has one job and one specificity. And K cells are a little bit different. Um, these um, natural born killers ask two very simple questions. Do you look healthy to me or are you stressed? And so a healthy cell here on the top will basically have this piece, this MHC class one that presents to the T cell, the piece of pathogen or tumor. If it's a healthy cell, it will have a healthy level of this protein, and that will ligate an inhibitory receptor on the NK cell, and the NK cell will not be activated to kill. If the cell is healthy, it will also not be stressed, and it will not abrogate what we call stress ligands. 
those are not as specific as these little pieces of pathogen or tumor. They are general stress ligands that basically say, hey, I'm not feeling well. Um, I might be infected, I might be malignant, my genome might be uh, damaged, um, I, I am under stress and I am not normal. Um, so if you have a stressed cell or an infected cell, a tumor cell here on the bottom, then these activating ligands are act activated, they are expressed on the cell, and these then ligate activating receptors on the natural killer cell to go ahead and kill this. Um, Oftentimes, these malignant or infected cells try to trick the T cell by downregulating um, this protein so that they cannot be seen by the T cell. Luckily for us, the natural killer cell can actually detect the absence of this molecule as a lack of inhibition. And so you get lack of inhibition plus activation. The NK cell sees a stressed cell that looks abnormal and it will be activated to kill it. And then you get those red granules that basically polarize and get dumped on the cell to punch holes into it and to kill it. Whether this pathogen is a virus or a bacteria or a cancer, um, it does not matter to the NK cell. Stress is stress, abnormal is abnormal, and it can basically kill a wide variety of targets, unlike the T cell that is specific to just one thing. So um, tumor-fighting natural killer cells are great. They can kill tumors very efficiently. But just like if I asked you to do uh, heavy lifting without any breaks, at some point you would get tired. And K cells inside tumors that are overwhelmed and constantly stimulated by this tumor microenvironment get tired, they exhaust, and they change the way they look. And so this happy killing and K cell will stop making its molecules to form these pores and kill cells. They will stop making signaling molecules to tell other immune cells to come and help. And they will upregulate these off switches that we call immune checkpoints. And so over time, when you overwork your NK cells, it will become exhausted, it will become tired, it will stop working, and it'll have all of these off switches expressed on it. And tumors have learned to exploit this. They can induce these off switches on NK cells, and they can also express ligands to ligate these off switches and tell the NK cell, yes, it's okay, you should be tired, and you shouldn't be doing anything anymore. And that way they can grow. So. Within the past 20 years, we've actually learned a lot about these off switches and drugs have been developed to block immune checkpoints. Immune checkpoint inhibition is FDA approved for several cancers. Um, it is often better tolerated than chemotherapy. It is potentially a cure even in metastatic disease, even though only a portion of patients benefit. And those are the ones we think reactivate the immune system to then go and search the body to kill stress cells or malignant cells. It is used in a variety of solid and hematologic malignancies, so solid tumors and blood cancers. And there are biomarkers available to predict the response to therapy. So your doctor can take a specimen of your tumor and send it to a lab, and they can then investigate it and say, okay, these off-switch ligands are expressed. We think that perhaps this is a candidate for immune checkpoint blockade. Um, and we think immune checkpoint inhibition works through the activation of T cells to fight the tumor. So here's an example. This is lung cancer where this actually worked. You can see here in the brown that with chemotherapy plus checkpoint blockade, the survival was much prolonged and more people survived in the time frame of the study than here in the green where patients received uh, chemotherapy alone, but no checkpoint blockade. And so the difference between the green and the green and the brown and the green and the blue um, is the addition of checkpoint blockade in addition to chemotherapy. So in the blue, chemotherapy was given first. That damages the immune system some. So maybe that's why in the brown, you have activation of the immune system and then chemotherapy, and that's perhaps better. But this was a successful study. When um, clinicians tried this uh, with pancreatic cancer, it was not a successful study. So two different checkpoint blockades together even were not able to improve the outcome 
for pancreatic cancer patients, even when checkpoint blockade was given, the lines overlap, as you can see. So with and without treatment, people progressed the same. And the outlook was not good. Um, you know, at 15 months, there were barely any participants still alive. And so at this point, um, the scientific community, I think, got discouraged and decided that pancreatic cancer is what we call a cold tumor. It is a tumor that is not interesting to the immune system. It is not inflamed. It is not um, activating uh, immune attack uh, to the tumor and checkpoint blockade is ineffective for that. And so that brings us back to surgery if possible and chemotherapy and radiation. Um, but when, so I'll summarize first and then I'll tell you what we did with this. Um, so within the first, uh, uh, within the past uh, 40 years, um, overall survival has not significantly improved for person with pancreatic cancer. Immune cells fight cancer, but they get tired when they are exposed to tumors for a very long period of time. Um, some of the causes of this immune cell exhaustion are known and can be targeted with checkpoint inhibitors, which are FDA approved drugs. And these drugs work for several liquid and solid tumors, but they do not work for pancreatic cancer. Um, and as pancreatic cancer is unresponsive to immune checkpoint inhibition, new therapy approaches are needed. And so my lab wanted to take another look at the tumor and ask what other components of the immune system can be actually harnessed to eradicate this tumor. So pancreatic cancer, um, something I can tell you about specimens we get from the clinics, from the biorepository at UCSD is that sometimes they are so hard that we have trouble cutting them even with a scalpel. They are very fibrous. And so in this picture here, where somebody summarized you know, the immune cells and the tumor cells in pancreatic cancer, the artist um, drew this really fibrous hard capsule as these gray lines. Um, and to show you a real life tumor, this is a specimen that we got fresh from the clinic at the day of surgery from a donor who was newly diagnosed and had not undergone chemotherapy or radiation and who was kind enough to donate um, their tumor to science. You can see here in red, there is this normal piece of pancreas and everything that is um, this greenish color is actually tumor and the greenish color are collagen fibers in the tumor. And so 41% of this tumor is collagen fibers. And you can see that they're not nicely aligned. They're all over crisscross. And, and this is really a hard mass, fibrous mass that surrounds tumor cells. And you can see this also here in blue with the Mason's trichrome staining. Everything in blue here is a collagen fiber. And now imagine you're asking your immune system, your immune cells to go crawl through all of that to find cancer cells to kill. And so this is a really hard fortress that the tumor is inside of, and it's very difficult to get through. And so the cells, the, the green cells here, the tumor inside, this is the fibrous stroma. And some of these cells are supposed to be the good guys, the T cells here. Um, and a lot of these other cells, are immune cells that are actually beneficial to the tumor that in this very strange hostile environment have learned to help the tumor and suppress the immune system. Something else we noticed, and this matches this fibrous fortress is that for example, lung cancer, where the immunotherapy worked compared to pancreatic cancer, where the immunotherapy didn't work, is clearly much more infiltrated with immune cells. You don't have to be a scientist to see that here, the lung cancer side, the left side here, is full of immune cells in yellow and red and green, um, and the cancer cells here in blue, um, compared to the pancreatic cancer, where also the cancer cells are in blue, and you can see much fewer immune cells infiltrating this tumor. But something that was interesting to my lab, since we study natural killer cells, was the amount of green that we saw here, because that's NKP46, that is the marker we use to identify those natural killers. And looking at this, we thought we saw quite a lot of them. And so we quantified this. We basically used many patients, many slides, much counting. Um, and we asked, what's the percentage of all the immune cells 
um, made up of natural killer cells versus the cytotoxic tumor fighting lymphocytes. And as you can see here, the natural killer is overrepresented compared to the cytotoxic T cell, and that matches our picture here, more green than red. Um, and about 20% of the immune cells are actually natural killer cells. That made us excited because that suggested to us that they somehow know how to get in. And so we looked, we um, looked at the tumor slices and we defined what is tumor versus what is stroma. And we then asked who is in the tumor section versus the surrounding stroma section. And we counted and quantified NK cells and cytotoxic T cells and asked how close are they to the tumor and how many cells are close to the tumor. And so you can see this here. This is the positive control. You can see that PAN-CK is our marker for tumor. It is not expressed in the fibrous stroma. And then when you ask, where is the natural killer cell in the specimen, you can see that there's an equal distribution between the tumor and the tumor stroma. So natural killer cells can go into the stroma and out of the stroma into the tumor. Cytotoxic T cells get stuck in the stroma. They're here much more than in the tumor. And we see this also here um, where we say, who is, how many cells are within 100 microns of the tumor cell? And 100 micron is a little bit thicker than um, a human hair. A human hair is about 70 microns. And so within a tumor cell distance of a little more than a human hair, how many NK cells are there? You can see there's a lot of NK cells close to the tumor and more NK cells than those cytotoxic T cells. And when we ask, how far away are these cells from the tumor? You can see that basically uh, the natural killer cells are closer to the tumor than the cytotoxic T cells. So why are they there? What is interesting to the natural killer cell inside a pancreatic tumor? Well, let's go back to the stress ligands. If the tumor expresses stress ligand that activates the activating receptor on the NK, then the NK should be activated to kill it. And so we stained the tumor, this time not for immune cells, but for these MYC-A and MYC-B stress ligands. And we found tumor cells in the tumor, but not in the stroma. We found stress ligand expression on the tumor cells and somewhat on the stroma. Some of the stroma cells can also express stress ligands, but mostly 80% of the tumor cells were definitely double positive for these stress ligands. And so natural killer cells are interested in pancreatic cancer cells because those cells express the stress ligands that NK cells need to be activated. And looking at this, we thought, okay, we have NK cells in the tumor, we have stress ligands, so why does this tumor grow? Well, when we looked at the expression of this activating receptor on the NK cell and the molecules, those red granules that contain those pore forming molecules and the enzymes that are needed to kill, our intratumoral NK cells had down-regulated all of this. They had an exhausted phenotype. They looked tired. And because of that, the tumor could get away with having these stress ligands and not being killed. And so we had exhausted NK cells inside the tumor that no longer expressed the tools needed to kill tumor. So natural killer cells can infiltrate pancreatic cancer despite its hostile fibrous stroma. In contrast to natural killer cells, the tumor fighting T cells get stuck in the stroma. And this may help explain why prior immunotherapy didn't work. If we reactivate T cells and the T cell sits on the outside of the tumor in the stroma, but cannot infiltrate the tumor, then maybe it can't kill the tumor. Pancreatic cancer cells express stress ligands that are interesting in activating two natural killer cells, but the natural killer cells inside the tumor are exhausted and the tumor grows despite the stress ligand expression. So can we use this stress ligand expression? and activated natural killer cells as an immunotherapy to infuse um, uh, highly activated NK cells to kill pancreatic uh, cancer cells. Well, this has been done for blood cancers, so we tried it for solid tumors. 
Um, the nice thing about natural killer cells is that you can take NK cells from the blood of healthy donors. So you could take my NK cells and activate them and actually infuse them into you. And they would not harm you because they are inhibited by healthy cells. Um, unlike T cells, which um, would see your body as foreign and would start attacking your tissues. So T cells, you have to basically match. You have to take from the same person, infuse back into the same person. And K cells, you can take mine and infuse into yours. Um, and so we took healthy and K cells from healthy adults um, and we fed them, we activated them, we gave them lots of growth factors, nice stimulation, um, and we overexpressed these activating receptors that are specific to the stress ligands we know are on the tumor artificially. And we grew many, many NK cells. And when we looked at them, they had a really robust expression of these activating receptors. They had lots of these red granules with the pore forming proteins and perforin and granzyme enzymes to kill cells. And they made lots of um, other factors that are helpful to get help from other immune cells. And they looked like really happy, healthy, ready to go NK cells, ready to kill. And so we took them and we put them in a dish with food and we took a tumor from the clinics, a fresh tumor, uh, and we ground it up into a single cell suspension and we put the cells together and we asked, can the natural killer cell that is not exhausted, that is stimulated and has activating receptors, can they recognize the stress ligands on the tumor cells and can they actually kill tumor cells in this tumor cell suspension? So in this case, they don't need to crawl through any stroma. This is just the first step in vitro to see if this actually can work. And you can see here, the tumor cells the, at the starting point and we get different size tumors. So we have different size, different numbers um, to start with um, without the NK cells. And then um, six hours later in the presence of NK cells, you can see that basically those numbers are reduced. And when you calculate the percent killing here, you can see that for one donor, 75% uh, of the cells were killed in six hours. For the second and third and fourth donor it was 20% and around you know, 55, 60%. And this is in six hours. And so our happy, healthy, activated, activating receptor expressing NK cells are very good at killing tumor cells when they're co-incubated in the lab. Now, a dish in the lab is not the same thing as a person in the clinics. And so we wanted to have an in vivo model where the tumor can grow in a live animal and where we can try the therapy in vivo. And so we took tiny little pancreatic uh, tumor pieces and we surgically implanted them into the tail of the pancreas of a mouse that is basically the equivalent of David the Bubble Boy. It's genetically engineered to not have an immune system. And without this immune system, the mouse cannot reject the human tumor. And so this is the incubator that we use for the mouse to grow a human pan pancreatic cancer. And um, this mouse can actually also metastasize the tumor. Um, and so we can follow this tumor growth by ultrasound because the tumor is inside the mouse. Um, and so we use ultrasound and you can see here, you can see the tumor and we can measure the tumor and we can get a good estimate of its size. And so this is an example of a cohort where many mice were implanted with the same person's tumor pieces um, and they grew tumors over time and we could track that by ultrasound. And so here we waited until the tumors were seven millimeters cubed. This is about the equivalent of a one inch, a little bit larger than a one cubic inch size tumor in a person. Uh, so it is a sizable pancreatic tumor. Um, and when the mice reach this seven millimeters cubed um, tumor size by ultrasound, we started infusing these supercharged natural killer cells that express this um, NKG2 deactivating receptor. And you can see here, without the infusion, without therapy, the tumor grows quite substantially in the control group. But when we infuse the therapy here in red, you can see that mice barely grow any tumors. Some mice cleared tumor and residual tumors in um, the other mice were really, really small. 
We also tested if this activating receptor that we're overexpressing is important for this recognition and killing. And you can see here that when we block this interaction between the stress ligand and the activating receptor, uh, we get an increased tumor growth and we no longer get um, resolution of disease. We don't get complete responses. So some of these mice, at least by ultrasound, looked like they had cleared tumor. So we stopped the therapy and we waited six months. Six months is a long time for a mouse. A mouse lives about two years. Um, and about half of the mice that were in complete remission by ultrasound remained tumor-free for at least six months after the therapy was stopped. Um, and in the other half, we found very small tumors. Um, when we opened the mice up. And so we don't know if they had always been there and just not visible by ultrasound or if they had recurred, but none of the tumors were big like this or like that. They were tiny. Um, and so there was either complete remission uh, or stable disease in our animals. And so just to conclude, um, due to pancreatic cancer's hostile stroma, immune cell infiltration is very low in pancreatic cancer. Nevertheless, 20% of pancreatic cancer's immune cells are natural killer cells, and more natural killer cells than tumor-fighting T cells are located in the tumor and closer to the tumor. Tumor-fighting T cells get stuck in the tumor stroma, and they do not reach the tumor cells. In growing tumors, natural killer cells unfortunately get tired, they're exhausted, and they do no longer kill the tumor. Um, and healthy activated natural killer cells, however, can kill pancreatic cancer cells in the lab in a dish. And the same healthy activated natural killer cells can eliminate pancreatic cancer in mice that grow human pancreatic tumors. And one half of mice that reached um, complete uh, responses uh, remain tumor free um, and also metastasis free for at least six months post therapy with the other mice having stable disease. And so, um, future directions this is an early stage project. Um, we think that we've made some progress, but there's still a lot of basic research and, and outstanding questions to be answered. Um, our goal are to um, improve uh, natural killer cell infusion products to lower the required uh, number of infusions. This makes it more um, friendly for a translation into the clinics. Um, we want to identify the mechanisms natural killer cells use to actually exit the tumor stroma and migrate into the tumor. Um, this is important because we could overexpress this mechanism and we could perhaps also overexpress it in T cells and help the T cell to get closer to the tumor, then we would have natural killer cells in the tumor and T cells in the tumor, more is always better, and they might cooperate and help each other in killing the tumor. Um, we want to determine the effect of the therapy on the tumor's metastatic potential. Um, this is very important because even when um, persons with pancreatic cancer qualify for surgery, they, um, often recur, they have recurring disease, either at the same site or at distant sites. So metastatic disease is what kills um, pancreatic cancer patients. And we have not had sufficient numbers of mice with metastases to statistically evaluate this therapy. So we want to do that. And of course, we want to publish our results because that shares the results with the scientific community. There are many smart people working on this. So maybe they can look at our data and have some good ideas, or maybe clinicians can look at our data and get inspired and think about perhaps um, taking this into the clinics, which is something that basic researchers do not do. Um, and of course, the overall long-term goal has always been to significantly increase pancreatic cancer patient survival and cure rates. And so science is teamwork. Um, all of the data that I've shown you um, was generated by a very talented postdoc, Christina Zalfa, here at Scripps Research. And we collaborate very closely with uh, Dr. Becky White at UCSD and the biorepository at UCSD. Dr. White is a pancreatic cancer surgeon, and we get a lot of specimens from her um, patients who consent to donate their tumor specimens to uh, research. And also Dr. Marjkan Hosseini, who is at UCSD, she specializes in 
um, pathology of the liver and the abdomen basically um, and she can take a look at all of our uh, slides and and give us the uh, clinical viewpoint of what our therapy looks like inside the tumor what she sees from a pathology standpoint um, and she can verify for us that our ultrasound data are correct um, in terms of what we identify as a tumor and what we identify as a cured mouse um, and so all of this is very important and is a teamwork that has been ongoing for um, several years. And so many thanks, especially to the persons with pancreatic cancer who are donating tissue to research. We are forever um, in your debt. Um, these people know that likely what we do now will not be fast enough in the clinics to help them. Uh, they donate anyway. Um, and we really appreciate um, their participation, and also my collaborators and definitely my laboratory. And so I'm very happy uh, to take any questions that you might have. Thanks, Silke. Thanks a lot. Terrific presentation. Lots of uh, interest and a lot of questions coming from the audience. Uh, I'm going to uh, try to aggregate some of the questions. And um, So you talked a lot about stress ligands. And, and so are, you know, what are the stress ligands? Are they common to all kinds of cancers and, or are there some that are peculiar to pancreatic cancer? So that's a very good question. Um, I, there are no stress ligands that I am aware of that are unique to pancreatic cancer. These are common stress ligands that are shared um, between different uh, cancers and also infectious disease. Um, stress ligands expressed by infected or malignant cells um, can also be upregulated by many different cell types in the body. And they are generally low when you are healthy, when the tissue is healthy, when the cell is healthy. But um, if the cell becomes infected or malignant, and that often goes together with um, mutations in the uh, DNA of the cell, then these stress ligands are induced and upregulated. And so your different tissues, different cell types in your body will express the same stress ligands, and they will do that if you have the flu or a tumor. Um, and this is in large part why my laboratory is so interested in them, because we feel that the same natural killer cell infusion product can, could be used to treat a large variety of different types of diseases. Right. Um, and so this, this is a, a off the shelf product that could be readily available also because we do not need to take the same cells from the person and give it back to the same person. We could have product available to treat a large variety of different diseases because of that. Yeah. So, so along those lines, so, I mean, the NK cells, they had, they got their name by, by what they do, Yes. but what, what you're doing is supercharging them that makes them Rend you that renders them effective against these uh, certain tumors, but so what are they normally doing? I mean, we're, you know, they're they're in there, and and why don't they figure out how to do this on their own? Um, they know how to do this on their own. Um, I I can tell you. Um, all of you, if you are have made it into a middle age or older, um, even if you've made it into your 20s or 30s, your NK cells are normal. Um, there are very, very few described human NK cell deficiencies, maybe 50 families so far. And um, the disease manifests itself by lethal infections in early childhood, specifically herpes virus infections. But if... Um, persons with NK deficiencies make it into their teens, they often um, succumb to um, virally induced cancers. And so the reason um, most of us walk around healthy and we don't have you know, lethal herpes outbreak or, or cancers when we're three years old is that our NK cells continuously circle through the body and kill um, abnormal cells. What happens when you have a tumor grow is that this becomes overwhelming. So instead of basically pulling the weeds in your yard once a week, you have to do it 24 seven until you collapse. Mm -hmm. And um, there are lots of processes involved in this, but at that point, the tumor wins and outcompetes the NK cell and the NK cell gets exhausted. And that's where in the last uh, decade, um, clinicians have started infusing NK cell 
products. There are different types of NK-cell products available. Um, some are now FDA approved for blood cancers. Um, and we are still basically trying to figure out for which disease, uh, what is the best NK-cell infusion product for which type of disease and, and how can we make it even better? Uh, a couple of uh, uh, viewers circled in on this idea of using collagenases, maybe even getting the NK cells to secrete collagenases to help them wave their way into the tumor. So is, is there any uh, any merit to sort of enzymatic treatment? I know collagenases are used therapeutically for other things, but... I haven't seen NK cells engineered to secrete collagenase, but that's an intriguing idea. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think if it were locally contained, that would probably right. be good um, right. because we don't want to do it um, systemically in the body. That would not be good for many tissues. Um, but that's a very intriguing idea. I have not seen it um, in, the, in the scientific uh, literature, but that's definitely um, something to consider. So, so if, uh, I mean, I know you haven't, you haven't dosed people with these supercharged NK cells, but but do you imagine that they would also uh, attack other cancers that, that are in the body? I would think so. Any, any stress ligand expressing cell will be uh, a target, especially if it also downregulated uh, this class 1 MHC molecule that is normally used to present to T cells. And tumors often are, are low in that um, molecule. But yes, um, it would not be specific to pancreatic cancer. Uh, you could probably use it for, for multiple uh, tumors. Um, the question then is, do the tumors learn to evade that mechanism as well? Right. Um, there's always the cat and mouse game between the tumor and the immune system or the virus and the immune system where one learns from the other. And, and um, you know, there will eventually be some tumors I think will learn to evade that too. But yes, in principle, every stress ligand expressing tumor should be a target. So, uh, Silke, you were you were quite clear that this is very early basic research, and that you're you're hoping that the clinicians, uh, you know, read your papers. But but I people are really interested, and I think maybe maybe you could shed some light on the process. You know, what what would happen next? So, who how would you get this into into a clinical trial and into into patients? I think with more data in preclinical models, if we can make a good case that it is worth testing a physician, um, especially someone who perhaps already makes these um, infusion NK cell infusion products for blood cancers, could team up with a colleague on solid tumors, uh, an oncologist to treat solid tumors and start a phase one clinical trial to recruit just for safety. And persons would then um, be recruited uh, normally if they've exhausted all other options um, uh, to see if infusion of these products uh, are, are safe and well tolerated. So far, at least for the blood cancer trials, the NK cell infusion products have been safe and well tolerated for um, people who were treated for blood cancers. Um, and there are a variety of products currently in the clinics um, that either overexpress certain things on the K cells or just activate them generally. Um, if the results are good and from the safety trial, then phase two trials would be done. This is a larger group where some efficacy can be determined. If the efficacy is good in the phase two trial, then larger trials, phase three, can be performed. Um, this normally takes years and it kind of takes it out of my hands into the hands of clinicians. Yes. Um, but I, uh, you know, given that. Um, the FDA has now approved some NK cell infusion products to treat um, leukemias. Um, I, I think that that there could be some safety data already pre-existing uh, to accelerate this process. Yeah, and I mean the the prognosis for for these cancers is poor, so the 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 entry into research should be facilitated. Uh, so so, but but you're you're still saying it's going to be uh, it's going to be years. And so this is the reality that that we have that we have to deal with. But this is this is extremely exciting. Uh, you know, it's it's this is cutting edge uh, stuff. We're really proud to have you working on this. And thank you. We really really hope that it it will turn into a, a therapeutic approach that can that can treat uh, people in this and other deadly forms of cancer. 
So uh, there's a lot of questions. I want you all to know that we have the transcript from these questions and uh, we'll try to get Silka back to you uh, with, with answers if, if she can uh, by email. Uh, but we want to thank you all for tuning in. It was a really great lecture, a good way uh, to wrap up the season. So this is the final lecture for, for 2022. And uh, well, so next uh, January, we're going to resume the front row and um, I'm going to give a talk. So I also have a research lab and I'm going to tell you about what's going on in the Williamson lab. And we'll have uh, our podcast uh, uh, star, uh, Drew Duglin, is going to uh, moderate the front row, but um, you'll get to find out a little bit about what I do besides uh, uh, administration and hosting the front row. So uh, I hope we can see you all next in January. I think it's January 18th, but you'll all get pinged. Uh, and again, this, is, this uh, video is available. Uh, on the Front Row website. So please tell your friends and thank you all for tuning in. So we'll see you again next year at the Front Row. Bye, everyone.